May I have your attention, please? Before we begin, I would like to inform you about the rules of this event. One, Zoom participants log in with an account with the format full name underscore institution name. For example, Paramasepti underscore UGM. Two, participants wear neat and polite clothes. Three, participants who have been allowed to join by the host do not have to send a present in the chat column. Four, in the end of the meeting, the committee will share online presence through the QR code and chat column. Five, participants can submit questions in the question and answer session through the Q&A column with the format full name underscore question. Six, participants are required to follow the entire series of the program from the beginning to the end. Seven, participants who do not attend and fill the attendance form in both day one and day two will not receive a certificate. Eight, a certificate will be distributed maximum three weeks after the event is held. Nine, participants are not allowed to leave the meeting room without permission or do other things outside the event. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Guest Lecture on Health Information Management 2023, titled Digital Competencies for Health Information Professionals. Thank you for participating in today's event. This event is hosted by Health Information and Services Department Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada. My name is Francisca Ranti Citraloka as the host of this event. And now let me welcome our special guest. Welcome to our Honorable Professor Dr. In Insinyur Agus Mariono as the Dean of Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada. Welcome to our Honorable Dr. Norohman, SSEM.com, as the Head of Health Information and Services Department. Welcome to our Honorable Speaker, Ms. Heather Green, Associated Diploma of Health Information Management, Graduate Diploma in Information System, Master in Health Informatics, Fellow of the International College of Health Informatics, and of the Australian Institute of Digital Health. Welcome to our Honorable Moderator, Ms. Rita Dian Pratiwi, Eskop MPH. And last but not least, to the guests and audiences. Ladies and gentlemen, further for the sequence of our agenda, we will hear the National Anthem of Republic Indonesia, Indonesia Raya, and the Hymn of Universitas Gajah Mada. Ladies and gentlemen, please prepare yourself.
Services Department, Dr. Norman SSE Mkom. For Dr. Norman SSE Mkom, the screen is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our annual agenda. Especially starting this year, we are introducing a new concept, what we call International Case Lecture on Health Information Management. For this year's theme, we have chosen Digital Competency for Health Information Professionals with the aim of preparing health information management professionals in facing the era of electronic medical records. We are proud to inform you that this event presents two inner speakers, Mrs. Peter Gray, she is an international leader in the development, implementation, management of data, information system, terminologies, AHR, and education from Australia. Mrs. Sosna Salman, she is a PhD candidate in health information management at Iran University of Medical Science, Tehran, Iran from Iran. We hope that all the knowledge conveyed by these two speakers will be useful for all of us. Finally, I personally would like to express my deep gratitude to the speakers who are willing to participate in this event and also to the committee and all participants who attend this event. Once again, thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Nurrahman, SSEM Com, for the sentences. Now we are going to take a picture together. For all guests, please turn on the camera and we are going to screen capture for the documentation. Once again, I would like to remind all the guests, please turn on the camera because we're going to screen capture for the documentation. Thank you.
I will begin the documentation. Okay, for slide one. On my count, one, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will begin our main program, plenary session, who will be led by our moderator. It is now my deep pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ms. Rita Dian Pratiwi as Cup MPH. Hello, Ms. Rita. Good morning. Morning. It is nice to see you. And how are you today, Ms. Rita? Alhamdulillah, I'm great. Glad to hear that, Miss. And now allow me to read Ms. Rita curriculum kita. Ms. Rita Dian Pratiwi was born on September 13, 1989. She is on ongoing education from 2020 at Universitas Gajah Mada, doctoral program in Medicine and Public Health, Faculty of Medicine, Public Health and Nursing, FKKMK. From 2016 until 2019, she's a manager of research, community service and relations at Department of Health Information and Services, Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada. Right now, she is a chief editor in Jurnal Kesehatan Vokasional, National Accredit Sinta II. Here are some of her research and publications. Number one, Evaluation of System Information TB's Implementation in Indonesia, year 2022. Two, an analysis of readiness to implementation the CP to support the national health insurance process in hospital, a literature review, year 2021. Three, the barrier in implementation of CPTV in hospital, year 2021. Four, POSIA or POSHANDU app for Lansia, year 2020. Five, Validity of ICD code based on laboratory result in lung tuberculosis disease in the private hospital in Yogyakarta Province, Indonesia, cross-sectional study 2019. Six, implementation of menstrual circle book, Android-based applications to support the information and youth counseling center in program in Kuloprogo district 2019. Seven, meta-analysis of factors affecting patient satisfaction with health services in Indonesia, meta-analysis 2018. Eight, forecasting of patient safety incident at special region of Yogyakarta Hospital, year 2018. Ms. Rita Dian Pratiwi will let for the next few sessions. For Ms. Rita Dian Pratiwi, the screen is yours. Thank you, Ms. Moderator Francisca. Hello, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning to our attendees here in Indonesia, uh, esteemed colleagues and students and online participants, and good joining us from different time zones, particularly our esteemed guys from Australia. And welcome to the uh, IG HIM 2023 guest lecture on health information management. My name is Rita Dian Pratiwi and uh, it's my honor to be your moderator for today on the topic uh, Emerging Competitions for Health Information Professional in the Digital Era. Mm. Before we get in today's, uh, I'd like to extend welcome to our distinguished uh, speaker. She has bring uh, with her a well of international and national experience in the realm of uh, electronic health information management and e-health system. And she is an expert in creating practically 
uh, future focus solution uh, that prioritizes uh, the safe as use of computer technology in healthcare. Uh, she is Miss Heather Green, who joined us from Australia. How are you, Miss Green? I am very, very well. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. How are you feeling about sharing your insight uh, on such a crucial topic in the field of uh, health information management today? I'm actually really excited because I'm going to introduce a range of new things that um, I hope you will be able to embrace because there is such an exciting future for information managers. If we are able to embrace the new world, um, it's not about doing a lot of new things. It's about doing the things we know differently. Yes. So it should not be scary, but I know it is for some. <laughs> And I am not going to say you need to become a computer person. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> Your intention is uh, continuous. And I can say on behalf of everyone here, and that's uh, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> We all are very excited and eagerly looking forward to your insight. Uh, allow me to introduce you uh, properly to our audience. Absolutely. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we delve into the hard to the topic, uh, it is my honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Miss uh, Heather Green. Uh, let me, yes, with the Brickling PT. Uh, She is a Master of Health Information and a Fellow of Australian Institute is of Digital Health and Fellow of the International Academy of Health Science Informatics. And Heather is an international leader in the development, implementation, manage management, and government of health data, information system technologies, uh, EXRs, and education. And She provide a practically practical implementation based approach to health data and concept representation. And uh, Heather's experience is uh, globally respected. Uh, she has a lot of experience. Uh, she has worked with hospital, primary care, district nursing, and diagnostic service, and with national programs in Europe, USA, Australia, Brazil. China and Caribbean, and she works with the, uh, both vocational and university education program in health information and standards. And also she is active in the implementation of digital health solution, including the design of EXR concepts, use of terminologies and classification as such as, as Noma City, as we know, and advising on clinical knowledge management implementation Natural language processing, mapping, and data specification. And <clears throat> what set uh, Heather apart is uh, her unique leadership uh, experience across major health informatics organization. She has experience in the leadership position, such as uh, membership of IFIMA strategic director pillar, convener ISO TC2. 150 VG3 semantic context, where she lead international standard on identify identity management, data quality, mapping, and concept representation, chair open EXR education program board, post chair of uh, XL7 terminology authority, past co-chair XL7 vocabulary vocabulary working group and past chair of Nomad International Education Six and expert member of learning uh, advisor committee. Uh, Hidal, we are immen immensely honored to be to have you uh, here today and eager to learn from your rich uh, experience and insight. But uh, before we start our discussion. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as we here to discuss emerging competencies for health information professional is uh, in in the digital era. Uh, we have one hour for you to presentation and uh, let me uh, give you reminder for the timing. And uh, for all participants, uh, to remind the flow and quality of our discussion, we have a specific for process uh, for submitting your question. Uh, for all participants, please uh, keep your microphone mute uh, during the presentation. And then question can be submitted via uh, chat uh, and we'll address them in the Q&A session. And uh, we will only be able to accommodate three questions for each section. Uh, Thank you uh, all for your attention. Uh, so far, without uh, further ado, it is now time for the main event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my immense pleasure to pass the virtual stage uh, for the over to Miss Heather Green. Uh, Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. That has been an absolutely fantastic introduction. I feel I do feel very honoured by that introduction. Um, but I am I see as I travel around the world a whole new era with so much exciting opportunity for health information managers. So I want to introduce some of this to you all so that you can see how we can move forward into this exciting new future. So if we think about health information management, it has typically been about what is in the record, its content. You know, we manage forms, we manage how data is collected. We manage filing and retrieval systems. We manage reporting of data and design of some systems. We are custodians of data. We look after privacy and freedom of information. We also manage code systems. And in the past, that's largely been ICD, but in the future, that is a much bigger area. The whole area of ICD is going to change. Um, so I'm going to talk about the old and how it translates into the new and what skills you need in the new world. So we're all used to the record itself. How is that changing? So if we think about content design, in a traditional record, the content design was about forms. You design the forms to collect data for specific purposes. And those forms were largely related to a process or a workflow. And they had different people contributing to the forms, not always one person. In a computer-based world, that is completely different. In a computer-based world, the content of the health record is about individual pieces of data. And we only think about content in the way we design screens um, to capture bits of data, but the data gets used over and over and over. In a form, it's only that piece of data. If you write, my date of birth on that form, then that's where it is and that's where you have to go to find it. In a computer, if you write something on a screen, it gets stored in a system that can be retrieved many times. You don't have to keep collecting it. So instead of understanding the forms process, we now need to understand data and how it is represented in computer systems. So the skills we need there is to have a good understanding of what software systems are actually offering us. And this is one of the key issues that if we're going to really move forward in a way that is efficient and safe for patients, that gives us the best data we can, we will move forward with data in our electronic health record systems that are in what we call a standard platform. I'll talk more about this in a few minutes, where the data is always expressed the same way. You know, 
you don't need 10 different ways to express blood pressure. A GP might only need diastolic and systolic pressure, and a cardiologist might need to know what sort of cuff was used, what was the device that measured the blood pressure, were you sitting or standing, were you running? They might need more, but the diastolic and systolic pressure data components are still the same. So there's no variate. We need to be saying things using one language in terms of each piece of data we collect. We need skills in how we design that data. We need skills in being able to choose the right code system to represent what the clinician meant when they recorded the information. Um, in our old systems, the clinician largely wrote everything in longhand. You know, they just said what they wanted to say. We need to provide computer systems that capture the information the clinician wants to say in a way that a computer can use that information. So we need to understand some new code systems. We need to understand SNOMED CT and LOINC and maybe DICOM, the um, language that's used for radiology reporting. And we need to understand how to design screens. What is different about designing a screen to designing a form? There is a lot that is different. But you don't need to understand all the details about how the programmer makes it happen. You need to understand what you have to be able to tell the programmer. So you need to be the director of the process. You need to be the translator between the clinical person and the technical person. That takes some new skills, yes, but it also takes some confidence. We also need to think about how we use the content of a record. Traditionally, much of our content, content was about um, what we had to report to somebody, what we had to report for billing, what we had to report for national reporting, often imposed on us from above. These were often data collections based upon a specific use case. You know, I'm collecting morbidity data. I'm collecting data for this piece of research. All of those use cases still exist in this new digital world, but how you do it changes. So in the digital world, instead of having specific data collections, uh, and the best example I can think of was I saw in, I won't name the country, but it was a country in Asia, it was not Indonesia, it was not Australia, <laughs> Um, where they had a data capture system for TB, a data capture system for malaria, a, and a data capture system for another disease. I can't think which one it was. It might have been diabetes, I think. Yeah, or, yeah, diabetes. And they all collected similar information, but not the same. They used different age grouping codes. They used different um, sex codes for sex. They used different codes for diseases, which might be sensible. In the digital world, where the data is standardized, instead of designing collection systems, you are designing extraction systems, designing systems that can pull data from a standardized health record. Often that will mean using rules. So saying, if this happened and this happened, I want to know about something. So if we're going to do that, we need to understand how to write rules that a computer can apply. And computers are really stupid. You, it's a little bit like writing a set of instructions for a four-year-old. It's not hard to do once you realize that it has to cover every option. And we have to think about data no longer as being static. Once you write something on a form in a paper record, it doesn't change. It is in that record, it's there, that's it. Once you collect data in a computer system, it can move to other systems. It can be changed. It can be a date of birth when you collect it, but now it becomes an age 
at admission. And that happens automatically. So how does the data grow and change through your supply chain? From the point of collection at what we call the source of the data, the clinical encounter, through to all the other uses of that data. We need to understand that supply chain. We need to understand the messages that are used to send data from one system to another. Now that uses tooling from a, a standards body called HL7. Um, you might hear of HL7 FHIR, F-H-I-R, which is um, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. You need to not be able to necessarily write software code in FHIR, but to know what FHIR is and how it works. We need to be able to also get the most out of the data that we collect. Once you've got an electronic record, you have data that can be analysed, that can be um, investigated. So we need to know how to do that analysis and how to take the data in our systems and deliver knowledge back into our systems, how to give clinical decision support. The knowledge that HIMs have about what is in a record and how it works along with clinical activity put us in a really good position to do those sort of tasks. Now, I've talked a bit about standard data and I thought I better explain what I mean. So how do we standardize data? In a patient folder, the standards are really the forms. And the standards were also that you would have a part of the folder for each inpatient episode, maybe a part for laboratory tests and a part for um, correspondence. You know, there were sort of standard structures to our record. In an electronic world, what I'm showing you here is an international standard for the content of an electronic health record, how it is structured so that everybody can use it. This is not about screens. This is just about the data. How would you be storing the data? So we talk firstly about compositions. A composition is any data collected at a particular point by a particular person. So if you go to see your doctor, he might have a composition that says he found these observations, he gave you this medication, and he recommended you come back in three weeks. That would be a composition that he signs once on a given day and time. The sections might be orders for medications, for tests, for other things. And there can be clusters of data. Um, our identity is one cluster of data. But all data is divided into certain sorts of things. Some things are observations. Observations in general are facts. They're things that somebody has identified. We have evaluations. Evaluations are always made by somebody with particular skills. So there, for example, it could be a nursing diagnosis would be an evaluation. Uh, a clinician might make a formal principal diagnosis. That would be the evaluation according to their knowledge and skills. Then there are instructions, orders given. There are actions, procedures done, um, drugs taken, all of those types of things. And then there's administrative data and demographic data. So this gives you a standard structure to store your data. And you might say, well, why does that matter? For the last 30 years, I have heard people say, why can accounting and bank banking share data so easily when healthcare can't? And I used to think, well, healthcare is much more complicated. Accounting's easy, it's just numbers. Well, that's true, but there's another reason they can share much more. expenses and overheads. That structure has existed a long time. Because they have that standard structure, 
they may they have found going to computerization much easier than healthcare has. This model that you see here is the equivalent of that structure. And we've even taken it further internationally. We've gone and said that the best practice in EHRs isn't just to know that something is an observation or um, an order. They've taken it down to every individual data element you might want. This is called atomic data. So it's not just diagnosis. This is saying a diagnosis is made up of a, an, I've missed off the top of the screen, but the top one is the actual diagnosis. It's a code or something that represents it. It can have a clinical description that where the doctor wants to say more. It can have a particular body site. It might have a cause. When did it start? Um, when was it recognized by a doctor? How severe is it? Um, what is the status of this? Is it current? Is it old? Is it recurring? All of those things are a standard structure. And it's interesting. In the UK, when they first went to electronic records, and they've been using them quite a long time, the doctors wanted lots of free text because that's what they were used to. The UK has recently made a decision to move totally over to this type of standardised model. And the reason they've done that is because the doctors have realised that once you divide it up, it's actually easier to use. It's easier and quicker to enter your data. It's less complex. And if you want to retrieve something, if you just want to say, I want to see anything that's ever happened to this person's right leg, then the computer can go and find the body site easily and retrieve everything. So it's about collecting data and using what a computer is good at doing. And as I say, clinicians initially didn't want to do it this way, but they've changed their mind once they tried and realized what they could do, their minds have completely changed. So we're now looking at a filing system that has storage not based on forms and folders, but storage that's based on data and the relationships between that the data components. I've got an example to show you in a minute. The skills you need if you're going to be doing this is you need to understand that model, that information model, those standards. You need to know where to go to get them. And if any of you are inspired after this, you can go to just Google Open EHR Clinical Knowledge Manager or CKM. That is where all of this information is kept. That is the standard being adopted throughout Europe. It is already being used in, uh, in China and Brazil and in other countries too. Australia uses it, but it's behind the scenes in Australia. It's not up front. And you might say, well, if it's that good, why isn't it up front? Very simple reason. The software vendors we have, particularly if you are using large American companies, not just American companies, but they are the, the biggest ones. <clears throat> Sorry, apologies for the dog in the background. Um, the large American companies have their own information model. And if you use their structure, changing to another vendor is very difficult. So from a marketing perspective, a sales perspective, it is a big advantage to not be standardized for those vendors. So they don't want standards. But it's up to healthcare to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Vendor, Mr. Software Provider, we have to have standardized data. It is safer, it, it is cheaper, and it's the only way we will ever be able to get what we call plug and play. You know how you have apps on your phone and they all you can just download them and use them for all sorts of things. If you if we want to do that with healthcare, then you need a standard structure of your data so that those those packages don't stand alone. They can plug into your health record easily. This is why Europe is going in this direction and they're going in this direction fast. Some countries have actually put it into legislation. There are parts of Spain where no system that is not open EHR compatible will be acceptable. So data retrieval, 
we had manual. We had to find the record, pull it off a shelf, or we had to read through the record and abstract what we wanted. If we want to be able to um, collect the information once and then pull it out of our computer systems, we need these standard formats. So you also are going to have to understand more about how you ask questions of data that's in a computer system. As I say, you don't have to know how to write the software code, but you do have to know how to ask the questions. And that is a special skill. Um, we should be collecting less administrative data because a lot of the information is already there. If we think about ICD, for example, in Australia, we use extra codes. We have two different codes for asthma. One code for if it's treated and one code for if it isn't. That's ridiculous. It's still asthma. We should have two pieces, two data headings on our forms to say, you know, what are the long-standing diseases this person has and then which ones were treated? They're two different ideas, not two different diseases. So we need to think about that. So how is the EHR itself evolving? Well, the EHR is not about forms. It's all about data. So we think of having a platform. And a platform is software, often internet cloud-based software, that holds all of this data in a standard format. That means any system, provided it meets the security requirements, of course, can plug and play into this system. It makes interoperability easier, much easier, much cheaper, and it makes it possible to have more specialized systems. It makes it possible to have systems on your phone that access a standard platform. Much, much more viable, much cheaper to do and easier to run. We also need, so this is saying we have standard data elements all described the same way. We also need to be using a standard language and I'm not talking about English. I'm talking about some standard code systems like SNOMED. SNOMED has a structure too that is consistent. It talks about substances, so it has codes for every sort of substance you might want. For organisms, every bacteria, every virus, there's physical objects, for body structures, for different roles of people and for different actions. And these codes are standardized for the whole world. SNOMED can represent different languages though. So I can get the same code displayed in English, in Danish, in Chinese, but the code is the same. So, and Indonesia is one of the countries that has signed up to be a member of SNOMED International. That means that SNOMED is free for use in Indonesia for everybody but it's not like ICD. If you use it, do not think of it as being similar to ICD, it is not. So you're going to need to understand how to select the right code system because instead of them all being imposed from above, um, in a digital world, there will still be some imposed from above. ICD will still be around, it will be around for a long, long time. But in your individual records, you're going to need to represent and develop the skills to, to design your systems, to use the right code system, and to use your user interfaces well. There is a bad user design for SNOMED is where you have a list of 6,000 codes to choose from. We have some of those in Australia. That is not the way you do it. <laughs> um, it's not efficient. There are other alternatives. We also need to know how to implement our code systems properly. In the past, implementing of code systems, I'm thinking ICD, has always been imposed from the central government. I think it will be in future still, but I'm hoping that it will improve. There is a potential to simplify the way we collect the information by using the information model that has data elements in it. 
we are dependent upon standards for quality data capture and we need to write standards better. We're not very good at it. Coding standards at the moment. Lots of people around the world are working very hard to try and write good coding standards, but they're not writing them well. And I say that as the chair of a committee at the International Standards Organization. You know, I've written a lot of standards and the way we're doing our coding standards isn't the way you do it. If you want clarity and consistency and simplicity. So we need to learn more about how we design terminologies and how we use terminologies with our data structure, with our information model. I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. We need to learn more about writing, coding and data standards um, and how to implement our code systems in a structure. Remember I showed you that atomic data where we had a diagnosis that had the diagnosis and then the body part, all those sorts of things. We need to think that way in future. That is not how we've done it in the past. We've always aimed for one code and that's not very efficient. I'm gonna give you an example of that. Um, I know these are not the terms we use in ICD, but in terminologies, we talk about pre-coordination and post-coordination. And these are terms every health information manager should become familiar with. A pre-coordinated code is where you have one code that joins everything together, like pneumonia due to staphylococcus. So this has a code for pneumonia and its cause. Post-coordination would have two fields, one for the pneumonia and one for what caused it. It makes it easier to, co to collect because there's fewer codes. Uh, and one example of this, in um, the US ICD-10-CM, there are, I think it's about 180 codes for glaucoma. Now, in actual fact, there are, I think, seven types of glaucoma. But those seven types are then subdivided by, is it left, right, both eyes, or you don't know? So it's subdivided by laterality. So they add a bit for laterality. Then they add a bit for what stage is it at. And by the time they, and then they add another bit for, I think, related to causes. By the time they've added all these pieces, you've got so many codes to choose from, it's suddenly a long list. That is not the way to do it in a computer-based system. In the old world, before the computers, this was the best way. But in the new world, it is not. So if I give this pneumonia example or an, any example, we use that atomic data we were talking about before. You have a diagnosis of pneumonia, you have a body part of lower lung and the laterality might be right. And the cause might be staphylococcus. You might have a diagnosis of a common muted fracture with a body part of the mid shaft of the femur and it could be left. And you have an open wound of the scalp, both caused by a fall downstairs. So it's dividing it up and it's actually so much easier to code. It's much easier for a computer to retrieve the information if it's collected this way. And it's also easier to abstract the information from the electronic health record to get more accurate data because we don't have to translate as much as coders. So when we think about ICD-11 as a great example, it actually has a design that can suit atomic concepts. However, one of the problems is that its browser has used this pre-coordinated approach. It's, it said this plus this plus this plus this. Um, some parts of it you shouldn't even need. So some parts of ICD-11, some of the codes come from what I call the old world. So their browser, for example, has causations, um, that have been pre-coordinated. They pre-coordinated the cause and the laterality. For pneumonia, there is even something that has, um, what time of life has this occurred in? Well, we know the patient's age already. Why do we need to collect something new about their age if we've already got it in the patient's admission details? So we need to think, why are we collecting these things? In, when in the past we had no option 
and I can accept that ICD-11 may be implemented in places that still don't have detailed computer systems that give them all of this information. So I'm not actually critical that ICD-11 has included it, but if you do have local computer systems, don't fall into the trap of thinking you have to use this. You don't. Your implementation can be governed by your use case. So if it was pre-coordinated, and this is directly off the browser for ICD-11, it says if you wanted to say a comminuted fracture of the femoral shaft, this would be your code. I showed this to a computer friend of mine, and, uh, and they said, are they trying to encrypt the data? Are they trying to make it secret? And I said, no, that's not the objective. Um, this is not how you do it in a modern computer system. So if we look at um, the code itself, you don't do it that way. You use the code for the comminuted fracture and the code for the femoral shaft. That's what you'd use in your system, you should not use this pre-coordinated approach. It's not efficient. It doesn't work well in computer systems. It makes retrieval more difficult. So absolutely go the route of dividing your data into pieces. The next skill we need to think about is our healthcare systems. So we've been contributing to identity management systems for years. Traditionally, they've been manual and patient dependent and specific to each individual organization. But we're now moving to them being biometric, lifelong, cross organization, being able to merge and unmerge patients and to handle pseudonymization or anonymization. We need to understand the ISO standards for this, for identity management. Um, the standard gives you all the information you need on how you do this. But most health information managers don't even know there is an international standard on identification of individuals in healthcare. The patient administration systems, they used to stand alone. Now we're starting to share content. That means we're gonna need consistent structures and ways to assess quality. So again, we need to understand the ISO standards and we need to look at data governance quality measures. We need to understand them. Historically, data governance and data quality were measured at an end point. And things like unknown data was considered to be poor quality. That is no longer true because in a clinical system, um, for example, if someone asks me, do I have a family history? of cardiac disease, my answer will be, I don't know. Um, and they'll say, oh, um, don't you want to tell me? And I'll say, oh, I'd be happy to tell you, but I don't know. I will never know. I was adopted. I don't know. It's very simple. That is high quality data. It will never be better quality than that. There is no point you ever asking me again. It isn't that somebody didn't ask me. So it's not just that it's unknown. It's unknown because the patient doesn't know. So knowing why things are unknown is part of a new data quality vision that we have to understand. The fact that that data is not of much value for um, long-term reporting doesn't mean it's not high quality. It is the highest quality you can get. It's just not, a, it's not useful for analytics. Similarly, for fiscal management, we need to understand value-based care, not just DRGs, and how resource utilization and the systems that support that are used in hospitals. We need to understand clinical information systems and how they can plug and play and represent best practice and how you write rules for computers to distribute knowledge back into those systems. So they're all some big changes and some new areas of skill for every health information manager. In the technical area, the freedom of information, I think we need to understand how access control works, understand how we can manage misuse, 
with multiple point access and retrieval and work with IT people on that. I don't think we can ever be necessarily the technical experts in this area, but if you have a great passion for this side of things, then there are, again, fantastic international standards on how you manage privacy um, and confidentiality and all of those components in a digital environment. So really, I see this as a great opportunity to be part of a team, to think about our common digital health issues and realise that we're not, um, don't just reinvent the wheel. Don't look at a little part of the problem. Don't just look at a spoke on this, you know, one spoke on the bike. We need to look at the whole wheel and the whole bike. Um, and if you're unaware of this whole environment, you will almost certainly just look at the spike. I see it all the time. So we have to look at the wheel, but we have to make sure it's a wheel that doesn't only work on one road. So we need healthcare control of the data, not vendor control of the data. We also need to get rid of this attitude of our way is the right way. Some IT people just think, oh, I know what to do. I will do it this way. A lot of clinicians and health information managers think, I'm the expert in X, I know it. I'm here to say, I've been working in healthcare IT since 19, the 1970s. I don't know it all. I don't know anyone who knows it all. You have to work as a team. So we also have to recognize that health information managers in this area have competition. There are others who will take our roles if we don't learn the skills we need, will be left behind. So let's think about where we are now. If we think about skills in data design, I did a current estimate. Now, this is not what HIMs might say. I, my experience has been that a lot of HIMs would, there might be 50% of them might say, oh, I know about data design, but they don't really know about the data design needed in electronic health record systems today. I estimate that about 4% of HIMs understand this stuff well, and I'm probably being kind. Digitally HR design, I think it's less than 1% of HIMs actually understand how that works. The number of HIMs who understand enough about IT to do things like write rules for clinical decision support based upon our codes, about 3%, very small number. Concept representation, that's code systems. A lot of us know a lot about ICD code systems, but not about other code systems. So yeah, a lot of us know a little bit about the general world and a lot about one code system, but I don't think we know a lot about how to design code systems. I asked at the last um, national conference for health information managers in Australia, how many people in the audience, and there was about 200 people say in the audience, how many people had even heard of Jim Cimino's Desiderata on data for the information age? And it was written for healthcare. And there were about four people put their hand up, four out of 200. So that's actually only 2%. So there are things we need to know here that we don't. Information exchange, most people have heard of HL7 but don't actually know how it works. Most HIMs know what case mix is, but we only understand how it works in inpatient care, where it is diagnosis-based. In outpatients or rehab, it, it's not about the diagnosis. It's what the outcome you want is, usually. It's a completely different decision process. So I think there is enormous skill. Pick an area, any area like this, and think about, how you would like to specialise. Our profession needs specialists because nobody's going to become an expert in all of these areas. You know? And there is lots of room. You know, we're up to you know, 10% in some cases, but in most cases, we're well under that. So we have a lot of opportunity. So how do you get some skills? 
I would suggest choose a skill area and work in a team. Look at building your skills, getting the foundations. There are now some universities that are teaching these foundations, but recognize that they are largely just foundations. They're not the detailed skills you actually need to do the job. Um, and I see this as a big problem. I'm actually working with quite a few organizations and universities around the world um, to build, and even with some professional bodies in the UK, to build training programs that they can offer their members in um, SNOMED, Open EHR, data design, code systems, implementing ICD-11, all of those things. Um, there are skills offered by SNOMED International. Uh, they offer courses, but they are largely designed at the national agenda, not so much for local implementation. So be really wary of where you get courses from because often they're just um, somebody's read a textbook and they've created a course. They're not necessarily by people who've done it. There are a lot of courses starting to come up with just-in-time learning, which are shorter focused courses, and professional bodies are working on education for specialists to develop. So what do we need to do? We need to be open-minded. We don't have all the skills. EHRs aren't documents, although that's the way most health information management departments around the world implement them. They're data. The world is very open. Technology makes gaining skills open to all. There are e-learning courses all around the world. And you know, it is not that difficult to find some of them. Just be really wary. Uh, you know, check who is offering them. Do they actually have the skills? And you need to know the world. You don't have to be an IT nerd, but you do need to have an IT nerd on your team. <laughs> Um, you, they don't have to know all about healthcare, but they need you to know about healthcare. So the team is what's important. You have great value. So you could also look and gain skills. I'm not plugging this, but this is just an example of a book written by experts, not just a, a background technical document. But it's your choice. And I think the future is really bright. So choose a skill area, find a mentor or group to work with and work together and learn together. That's what I wish for all of you. Um, I hope I haven't gone through too fast and I know we've got some questions that will come, but I do think it's exciting, but I don't think it's as simple as a lot of the health information managers I know seem to think it is. It's not just about getting things into a computer. Digitizing your records is, is a help, but it's only one small step in this pathway. And the biggest one is to be able to standardize your data. You know, if I go back to anything, it's about being able to understand um, the approach where you have your data in pieces. And to know that you don't have to create these data definitions. They're all online. They're open. You don't have to pay to be part of the, this community. Uh, there are thousands of people around the world who contribute to it. Clinical people as well as HIMs. It can make our life easier and give us the control that we need. So I guess um, I'll be over back to, um, to Rita to see if there's any questions or the areas you'd like me to go over in more depth. And I'm sorry if I've gone a bit fast, I get excited. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Peter. What a lengthy presentation. <laughs> Uh, the time is uh, only a half, uh, but uh, it's no problem. Maybe we can uh, move in the Q&A portion, but before that, uh, on behalf of everyone, 
I'd like to express our deepest grateful for sharing your invaluable insight, uh, Miss uh, Peter. And uh, your expertise in the field has provided us uh, with practically and forwards and thinking perspective uh, that we can all benefit from. Uh, thank you for making this session so impactful. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now moving in the Q and I portion uh, of our event. Uh, we allotted a generous amount of uh, time uh, for this uh, to make sure your question uh, get the attention uh, they deserve. We have uh, ten minutes for now uh, for audience to uh, write your question in the chat in this uh, room. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, Miss Hitler, we have a uh, three question. Uh, may I read uh, one by one to you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, <coughs> you can answer uh, for the first question from Dian Yuliani. I can uh, screen screen design based on workflow be interpreted as interface design for health management information system. And is there a book that supports uh, the statement and serve as a guide? If uh, screen design based on workflow is a new competition for him, mm -hmm. uh, is the question? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I can answer that. Um, I think screen design is a new competency for HIMs. I think that you can't just take forms design and translate that skill to screen design. The skills are actually different. And where it relates to workflow, um, and yes, it is about interface design, absolutely. But it's also, say you had a form that um, was a pre-operation form and the anesthesiologist writes on it and then the nurse writes on it and then the doctor writes on it, for example. In a computerized environment, there might be a screen for the anesthesiologist and they will enter their bit and then that information will appear on a completely different screen that the nurse sees. So each screen is based around the individual's job the person who's trying to do the activity, not that the same person, that three different people will write on one screen like they did on one form. The, the flow is different. Instead of looking at the flow of the data, you're looking at the flow of the work. So you look at the person who is doing the job, not at how the data moves through the system. So you design the screens differently. You design them around what this person is doing, not around how the patient moves through the system. Does that? I hope that makes sense. Um, is there a book that supports? Um, I'll have to think. I can't think of one immediately that yeah. uh, talks about this. I know it is mentioned in a number of texts that I've seen and I've heard people speak about it. And I've certainly seen examples where you have a system that's been designed around a form and a system that's been designed around individuals workflows and they are very different. Um, I will see if I can find a good reference for you and I will share it um, after the session if you would like. Um, one of the issues we've found, for example, is a lot of the systems that the big computer systems, I'm not mentioning the vendors, but you all know who I mean, I would imagine. Um, they are often designed around a doctor's workflow and the nurses are forgotten. The nurses have to make the doctor's workflow kind of work for them. And yet we have more nurses than we have doctors. The nurses are what makes our hospitals work. We need workflows that work for the nurses as well as workflows that work for the doctors. And our systems are often not designed that way. You know, it's, they're often designed around the doctor 
And I'm not saying the doctor doesn't need screens. They do. But we've missed the biggest part of the workforce. <laughs> and that's the problem. So that's a good example of where this issue occurs. I hope that helped. Yeah. I think it's a very clear explanation. And we have continued to question number two. Uh, the question from Bunga Dwi Citra Lestari. Mm -hmm. The question is, in this modern era, we must develop our ability to use the technology. According to the aspect of data recording in slide three, what is the most currently needed important skill to learn? That's really hard. I can think of three. Can I have three? Uh, <laughs> three most important skills? I think the first one is to actually understand logic, a logical process. And we often talk about this as understanding if this, then you do something else. And if it's not this, what do you then do? So it's, it's called the if then this process. And that's an IT process, but you don't need to write computer code to understand that process. I think understanding the logic process is essential, absolutely essential. Because if you understand that, you know when an IT person says to you, I can't do that, you'll go, yes, you can. Why, why can't you? That's a very simple piece of logic. And you can have more control. Um, I find that uh, I call IT people out all the time because I do have qualifications. I can actually write computer code as well as being an HIM um, because I can, I know when they're telling me rubbish <laughs> and that helps. The next one is the information modeling and open EHR. I think we have to understand the data specifications and the standards related to them that are the base of our data. You know, we're the data people for healthcare. If we don't understand how that data is specified in an electronic record in a standardized manner, then I think we've lost it. I think we're, we'd be giving away our special skills. And the third one is concept representation. Understand how code systems work, not just be able to allocate an ICD code, but understand what are the um, requirements. How do you judge a good code system? There, there is a whole, the Desiderata I talked about before, Jim Cimino's document, um, tells you what are the things you need in a code system if you're going to use it in an electronic health record. And it's brilliant. And it was written in the 1990s and it hasn't changed. I mean, it's had little tweaks, but the principles of it, are still the same. You need a code system that um, doesn't, that when the meaning changes, you get a new code, for example. So the example I always use is if you say, if we had a code that said this person was um, simple in the 1950s, that would have been saying that they were open and honest. It would be a compliment. If you said someone was simple today, it would mean they didn't have a very high IQ. It means a very different thing. So the code, the word is the same, but the code can't be. So we have to understand that codes are not the same as the words that describe those codes. And that's a big difference in meaning. You know, that's a new thing to learn. Um, so I think they would be my three things. There's lots of other things. But if you get those, those three to me are the core to being able to manage information in a digital health environment. If you don't have those three, if you're missing any one of those three, you've got a problem. Yeah. Uh, and I think you. that actually answers the, the next question that I can see on the list is about how do you keep up with the rapid change? If you have those three things, you don't have to. Let the, let the techos do that. 
Um, if you govern the data, how it is used and represented, and the technology will change around you. It, that's, not, that's not the issue. I mean, it is an issue, but it's not the biggest one. If you get the data standardised, then the technology can change and it doesn't cause problems, doesn't cause safety issues because your data is still usable. This is why an accounting system can transfer from one software vendor to another over years. It hasn't specifically changed. You know, the accounting information model was developed 400 years ago. The information model for healthcare was developed about 20 years ago. It's very stable. It hasn't changed for a long time now. You know, 20 years it's been used for, but it hasn't been known well to health information managers. It's been the IT nerds who came up with it, but it works and we need to understand it. Um, so I think the way to handle the rapid change of technology is to allow the technical people to go off and do what they do, but we get an information system that is a platform they can plug and play their fancy stuff into. Um, we have enough to deal with that healthcare changes rapidly. <laughs> that we have to deal with, but not the, techno the technology. We need to understand the logic, yes, so that when they say they, they're going to change something, we can know whether that's a problem or not. Um, which question do you want me to answer next? Because there are two, there are a few more. Yeah, uh, Miss Steven, thank you. Uh, we are fortunate to have some additional time at our discussion today. Right? So, for <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this provides a rare opportunity to discuss even deeper into the critical area of. Him, uh, I invite you to capitalize uh, on this by asking Peter Green any more question you may have. Uh, please uh, write in the chat. Uh, so the, the next question was how the development of healthcare systems abroad from the past until now has has happened, and how does how relevant are Indonesia's systems? I am quite sure that Indonesia's systems are relevant. Every country on the planet has what we call legacy systems. It has old systems and it has old data. We are all experiencing that problem. The issue is how do you move from the old to the new? And in the past, when we moved from an old system to a new system, we would usually have a new software product and we would have to convert all our data and the IT people would be mapping data from one area to another. It would be very costly and very time consuming. So no matter what we do, we're probably going to have to do that task. But the suggestion that's coming out of European experience is if you, do, you can do it once and not have to ever do it again if you map it into the standardised information structure. If you do it that way, then you are future-proofing your system far better. But you can't do everything at once. For example, um, in the UK, in England, they decided that they would have one hospital try it out, and that hospital did it department by department. So they did it kind of specialty by specialty. So they did the patient ID and the basic administrative, you know, admission, discharge, that stuff first. Then I think they did obstetrics. And it's interesting, Jamaica's doing obstetrics first too. Um, they're, they're moving from their old systems into uh, an EHR platform and they're just doing it bit by bit. And that makes the size of it doable. You know, you're not trying to change everything at once. And it gives any vendors you have, um, if the say there's a vendor in Indonesia who wants to develop something for um, a phone-based system of, of obstetrics, and they know that there is going to be a national, national or a regional electronic health record 
platform that holds this standardized data, they could build their system for that and it could plug and play in Indonesia, but it could plug and play anywhere else in the world. So it gives an opportunity to your software vendors, if they're smart, that um, they could develop things that could be used much more broadly. Uh, this is what there's software vendors in Jamaica, tiny country, but their software vendors are starting to say, oh, we could develop these things that could be on um, you know, mobile apps or whatever um, that will make collection of data easier. We won't need to have computers everywhere. People have phones. We can do it that way. So we're looking at transitioning probably over the next 10 to 15 years, I would think. You know, we're going to have those older systems that are going to hang around, but we will be progressively changing. So I think that is a challenge. Now, what they're doing in Europe is the same. The Scandinavian countries have been using the open EHR approach now for nearly five or six years. They've done it the same way. They've done progressive changes of different parts of their system. They haven't tried to do it all at once. It's too big to try that. Um, so my suggestion, we might have a team to develop together. What about us as individuals? Um, you might, within your professional body, you might say, let's get a group together to look at what we could use OpenEHR for or how we could use SNOMED or, you know, and go and do some training together. You know, if you approach a lot of education providers might give you a cheaper deal if you have, you know, 10 or 20 people coming and doing a course together, do it together, learn together. Um, that's an option. So yes, you could do it as individuals, but you might find it more, you might find it easier to do it as a team. And there's really no reason why you shouldn't. And then you can provide that input on that particular specialty area across, you know, into the professional group across Indonesia. So think about how you might work together to build something for Indonesia that's really valuable. Um, I don't see why you couldn't do that. Uh, and the last question there, um, we don't have to know about technology. Now, I've said you don't have to become a computer nerd. You don't have to learn how to program software or, or do any of those things, but you do need to understand the logic that is at the basis of the technology. So you have to understand the principles of how it works. So for example, if you wanted to retrieve data from your hospital system, and a doctor comes in and says, I want all the patients who had um, chemotherapy last year. And you went to the IT department and asked them for that. They would hit you with about 20 questions. Because they'd go, do you really want every patient who had chemotherapy? What data do you actually want? Why are you asking this? We need to understand how to ask those questions. So I would ask that doctor, do you just want your patients or do you want all patients? Do you want a particular cancer? Do you want a particular type of chemotherapy? Um, do you want people who received treatment within that year or people who started treatment in that year or people who finished treatment in that year? So what I'm demonstrating as I ask those questions is that I understand all the bits of the data and I can think about what might get me back the things they want. It's so funny. I worked at a very large hospital in Melbourne for a few years and um, people would always come to me when they wanted reports because they said if they went to the IT department, it would take them a month to get anything. But if I went to the IT department, I'd get it within a day. And they'd go, why? How come you get it so fast? And I said, because they trust that when I ask the question, I'm giving them all the details they need. It's a simple thing. They just write the query, get me my report and it's done. Whereas when that doctor comes in, they know they'll produce the report. He'll go, oh, that's not quite what I wanted. And it'll have 10 different modifications until it's right. So as I say, I don't think you have to become a programmer, but you do have to understand the data and you do have to understand the logic.
So there's special parts of technology, yes, but you don't have to understand, you know, how an HTML screen is written or even the fact that every web page is based upon HTML usually. You know, you have, you know, it's useful to know what cloud computing is. You know, there's some things you should know, but they're not detailed things. The things you're probably almost aware of through using your phone, but you might not know the names of things. You know, um, and what I do, yes, I can program, but I still, I, I take it so far and then I think, no, nope, I'm passing this straight over to the IT team. I'll let them deal with it. I'm not going to because it's not my specialization. Yeah, I can write software code, but I don't enjoy doing it. I'm not great at it. Um, I understand enough and that's it. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not suggesting you do that. If you choose to, if you're interested in doing it, then that could be a specialization, but I wouldn't put it on the list of things for if, that HIMs should have a specialization in software writing. <laughs> Business analysis, maybe. You know, information systems, yes, but not writing code. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Hitler. Uh, all the questions in the Q&A is almost uh, unsure, uh, but uh, we have quite um, engaged our audience today, not just from our immediate attendees, uh, but also from YouTube viewers. So uh, we have one more question coming from that platform, Ms. Peter. Uh, the question is from, come from Putu Nariswari. According to your suggestion, we must have a team to develop together. What about us as individuals? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the wrong question. Uh, can I uh, repeat the question? The question from YouTube. Uh, I just, in short, Jennifer. individual, yeah. you need to decide what area interests you. You can't yeah. learn all of this. So, yeah. and then get I'm your team sorry. together. Uh, this is uh, the other question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the question comes from Jennifer. Morning, Miss Hitler. Thank you for your sharing. Can you suggest us how to build the digital competencies for the new B clinic with limited human resources? Thank you. Sorry, so can you just say that again? It was about how do you put together the new competency list uh, for HR? Uh, yeah. Uh, mm. Can you suggest us to build the EXR in the clinic or dependent hospital like this? Mm. Clinic in here is a private uh, or small hospital in this area, yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, how to build the digital competencies for the, uh, with the limited uh, human resource in there? Yeah, yeah. I think you need to look for, as we say, you know, short courses on, if you're in a small organisation, the thing that's probably going to benefit you the most, hmm, the small organisations often get software imposed upon you. So the best thing to do there. I suppose the best thing to do there is at least to understand the data specifications. You know, what is each data element? What does it mean? And how is it represented? Um, and what any governance process is. So where do you get help from? Um, So I think it's really some of those foundational skills of just understanding what is coming, how you can prepare for those the changes like the new data items coming in, new software coming in, um, and how to 
um, how I, I guess it's how to be proactive about getting that information model. So I guess I'd say choose open EHR if you can only choose one thing so that you at least understand what the data could be. And when you look at a system that you're using and say you're making a change to it, could you change it and incorporate something from that model when you make the change rather than invent something that's new? Now, so can you use an existing structure or not? Um, or at least to know what it might equate to in that existing structure. I, I think that's about, you know, in a small system, that's probably what the best you can do. And the other thing I would do is I would get together with other people from small organ small groups, small um, healthcare providers. I would absolutely gather together and make sure that there is a representative of your group when there are discussions that impact the systems you use and the data that you collect, including when a national data collection imposes particular data on you. you know, like I don't know if you have three or four different data collection systems for things like TB and malaria and whatever, you know, to at least try and get them more consistent instead of having free data collections is just dumb. If you're a small organization, it's expensive to collect the data three times. It's a waste of money. Um, if you could collect it once and share it, you're way better. Um, so, and understanding perhaps the impact of identity management. Um, being able to, I don't know if you use a national number everywhere or not. So that when you share information, the person's identity is clear. Uh, or whether, um, again, I won't say what country it was, and it wasn't Indonesia, and it wasn't Australia. Um, they have a national number, but each healthcare organisation had its own number, and some of them didn't have a number at all. And yet they were trying to collect how often did a patient return to a healthcare organisation. Um, if you don't have any what form of identity management, the figures you're going to get will be rubbish. You know, there'll be a... Good guess. That's it. <laughs> but that'll be that'll be all. So it's about understanding opportunities and using your professional connections effectively. Because when you're a group, you're more powerful. If you're the one person in that little organization, you've got very little chance of making change. But if you're a group that represents all of those in organizations, you've at least got a chance. And I'm sure your national health information management body would support you as best they can. I hope that makes sense. Yes, uh, thank you for your explanation, Ms. Grit. Ms. Uh, it's great uh, we know about uh, everything uh, in the health information technology. Uh, but uh, 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 we are seeing is um, incredible levels of English uh, here is uh, fantastic for today. <laughs> uh, but maybe uh, due to the time constraints, uh, before we officially close today uh, in cycle session, uh, I'd like to give uh, the floor for you uh, one last time uh, to our uh, Sims uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Hita, uh, would you like to share some conclu conclusion uh, through our uh, final remarks uh, with our audience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I just think it's wonderful. There's been over 200 people on this call today, I noticed. That is fantastic. So you've already made it to step one because you're realizing you need more information about digital health. That is the most important thing. I see too many health information managers who already think they know it. And I see them go to meetings and they open their mouth and as soon as they say something, they make it very obvious to those of us in the room who do know digital health that in fact they know nothing. Um, I am, 
I get annoyed and embarrassed by that because I don't like members of my profession thinking they know things they don't. Um, so I am just excited by the fact that you're looking and saying, we need to know more about this. And there are so many areas to learn in this area. Um, you won't gain it all. Nobody can know it all. But you can choose the particular areas that are going to lead you and help lead Indonesia into a more cost-effective future and a safer future for patients. Because whilst we have data represented in different ways, in different systems, that's actually not safe. Because when that data gets translated from one computer to another, in some countries it has killed people because the data hasn't been translated properly, hasn't been mapped properly. So in the past, maps were just used for high-level governance decision-making, and if there was a little mistake, it didn't matter. But they're not anymore. Now they're being used for patient data, to share data. Um, we can't afford to have those problems. And HIMs have to lead it. You are the leaders of this for the future. So I wish you all so much luck. I am more than happy to help with advice or information if I can provide it at any time. Um, you know, we are Indonesia and Australia are neighbours, so I, I like to help if I can. People in the same time zone is a lot easier to help than when I was helping Jamaica with on the other side of the world. Um, but you're here. Keep coming to these sorts of events. Um, take what you hear and be critical of it because not everybody who talks will know everything about their topic. I don't know everything about my topic, but I know an awful lot at the level I've just discussed because I've seen it in so many countries. So I guess I'm just saying good luck and um, seek the um, education. I could provide a list of some courses that I know are out there if that would be helpful uh, to Francisca. Um, to share if, if that would be of any value to anybody um, you know, as a place to start. But um, there's not a lot out there yet. It's coming, you know, but uh, get together, work as a team because it'll be easier to learn and easier to get um, action. And don't be afraid. Okay, have courage. Uh, thank you very much, Miss Miss. <laughs> uh, your presentation has been nothing short um, of enlightened, provided us with uh, invaluable insight uh, into uh, information management. On behalf of everyone here and our online audience, uh, we extend our deepest gratitude uh, for your time and expertise. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can uh, we give Miss Peter a big round of applause to show our appreciation? Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank it was you. my pleasure. Uh, yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have to uh, come to close of uh, this comprehensive session on uh, emergency emerging. Uh, competencies for health information professional in digital era. Uh, our ins insightful uh, discussion has covered a broad array of critical topics in health information management. Uh, I trust uh, that you found uh, the di discussion and our speakers' uh, invaluable uh, insight. Uh, moreover, uh, our exploration uh, didn't just stop at the practical aspect. Uh, we dive into the core technology and standards uh, that shape uh, this field uh, from Sonoma City, which focus on clinical terminology, to X, uh, XL7, that brought uh, the way for healthcare interoperability. We touch upon the building blocks and modern healthcare information system.
and then uh, from basic principle principally uh, like data design and information modeling modeling complex uh, uh, modeling complex uh, to complex system uh, like digital EXR design we touch upon numerous uh, pivotal areas and uh, we discuss industry, uh, industry, uh, uh, industry standard, uh, just into a uh, data and su supply chain specification and consideration the importance of IT skills, I think. And we also, uh, look at the concept uh, representation across uh, healthcare and emerging trend of value based and cosmic system. And then uh, if there have any uh, shortcoming on uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, event, uh, uh, special thanks to our discuss uh, speaker, Peter Kim. Uh, for sharing uh, the expertise with uh, us today. And uh, if uh, there have any shortcoming on my end uh, as moderator, uh, I appreciate uh, you understand that uh, thank you for your active engagement and I assure you that uh, any feedback uh, will be uh, to enhance uh, in the future session. Uh, let us... Uh, carry to knowledge and insight uh, we have gained today into uh, our future endeavors and I wish you a great uh, day and uh, look forward uh, for seeing you at the, at uh, our next event. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you and bye. Yeah. Uh, bye. Thank you. Once again, thanks a million to our moderator, Ms. Rita Dian Pratiwi Eskop MPH. And also, thank you very much to our distinguished speaker, Ms. Heather Green, for sharing your insights and experience with us today. Before that, I would like to make some important announcements for all participants. The materials can be accessed at bit.ly slash ikhim2023 materials, and the certificate will be sent out no more than three weeks after this event. I would also like to remind all participants to fill out the participation form using the link or barcode provided by the committee in the chat box and on the screen. Participants who do not attend and fill the attendance form in both day one and day two will not receive a certificate.
It is unfortunate that we have reached the end of the event. I, Francisca Randi Citraloka, as the Master of Ceremonies of today's event, would like to thank all participants who attended today's event. As the representatives of the International Guest Lecture on Health Information Management Committee, I sincerely apologize for the many shortcomings and mistakes during the event. We hope that you have gained valuable knowledge and wish you to always stay healthy. Thank you for participating in today's event and see you at the International Guest Lecture on Health Information Management, Day 2. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Stop.